Hello, and welcome to episode 50 of Public Interest Podcast with your host, Jordan Cooper, where we interview politicians, activists, advocates, and others who seek to improve the state of the world. We're here today with Delegate Eric Lutke of District 14 in Montgomery County, Maryland. How are you doing today, Eric? Good. Excellent. So the first thing I'd like to ask you is what are you currently doing or what have you ever done to advance the public interest and why? So... That's a that's a long question. That's a, it requires a long answer, I guess. I um, uh, was raised by a, a mother who believed very strongly in service to the community, and mm-hmm. so that's always been sort of what I was interested in doing with my life. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I uh, um, have been in the past a classroom teacher in middle school. I'm back at the University of Maryland now and teaching undergraduates. Um, and studying myself as a PhD student. Um, and then also I serve in the Maryland legislature. Um, and that is um, a really great opportunity to make a difference for people. So what is, so your mother or- originally tried to convey to you that public service was something important. Mm-hmm. And you originally began doing that through education. No, actually before that. So, um, yeah, my mom was very active in the, the women's movement in the 60s and 70s. Um, the Equal Rights Amendment movement? Uh, before that even. I mean, back going back to before Roe versus Wade, and, you know, she was she was a part of all of that. And, and um, um, not as a national leader, but sort of, you know, somebody who did work locally. And she worked for the American Association of University Women and the League of Women Voters. So I was sort of raised in that context. Okay. Um, and so when I was a kid... Uh, relatively early, I had, I guess, what you would call a social consciousness and Mm -hmm. um, in high school got very involved with environmental organizing, um, first in my own high school and then helped co-found a countywide student environmental group and eventually became involved with the Sierra Student Coalition nationally. And was that in Montgomery County, Maryland? Yes. Okay. And then, so you became involved in, as an environmental advocate Mm -hmm. and you did that through school and then you decided to go into education, become a teacher. Right. So why did you become a teacher? Uh, Well, so interesting story. So when I graduated, I had expected to go into politics, right? Uh, That was sort of what my passion was. And my first job as an under, uh, out of um, school, when uh, after, out of undergraduate Mm -hmm. school was uh, to run a local campaign for the county council. And I hated it. Really? It was was awful, man. Like working, um, you know, endlessly long hours. you you, you have no benefits. The pay is terrible. You finish, and if your candidate loses, you're out of a job completely, and you mm-hmm. got to cast around for a new job. And I, I sort of decided that wasn't for me, mm-hmm. and um, so I went back to school to become a teacher, uh, sort of because I was casting around for something good to do. And mm-hmm. I had had great social studies teachers when I was a kid, and mm-hmm. I wanted to do that. And I expected to only do it for two or three years, and then I go into the classroom and I fall in love with the work, mm-hmm. and I got sucked back into politics through the teachers union who you know wanted me to get involved with some of their work, mm-hmm. both on politics and in, and policy, mm-hmm. um, and uh, and that you know that's 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 how it happened. So what exactly is, so I know that there is a teachers union in Montgomery County Mm -hmm. called the MCEA. Right. Now, do they represent every teacher in public schools in Montgomery County? They do. um, Well, so it's a little more complicated than that. The collective bargaining agreement they negotiate applies to every teacher. Now, for our listeners, what is collective bargaining? So collective bargaining, you know, the, the basic explanation of it is, Instead of an individual person working out their own employment agreement with an employer, Mm -hmm. it's a group of people, a union, Mm -hmm. who work together Mm -hmm. to establish the same employment agreement for all of their members. Um, It's essentially a way for workers to have some control over the the conditions of their work. And that gives more bargaining power to the laborers. Well, yeah. I mean, it puts them on an even keel. Because without a collective bargaining agreement, um, the administration or the employer or whoever it is Mm -hmm. would have tremendous power over them. And is the logic basically that it's easier to fire one employee who is trying to advocate for a contract that is not as attractive to the employer than it is to fire the entire employee force. Exactly. 
exactly. I mean, there's there's power in numbers, right? Mm-hmm. In, in education, for example, in the bad old days, before mm-hmm. collective bargaining and education, teachers were regularly fired for, you know, m- things that we would find anathema today, right? The um, There were schools that wouldn't hire black teachers. There were schools that fired women as soon as they got married or as soon as they became pregnant. There were schools that fired teachers just because the administrator, the principal, happened mm-hmm. not to like them, right? Hmm. And that's where teachers' unions really came from, was, was fighting back against that sort of arbitrary uh, employment decision. So did teachers' unions really grow in the middle of the 20th century? Before that, um, I, the first teachers' union in the country was uh, in New York City. Mm-hmm. And um, it originated in, I believe, the late 1800s, hmm. um, early 1900s, that era. Um, and that's where the union that I was a part of, the National Education Association, came from. They didn't at the time see themselves as a union. They called themselves a professional organization. And in, then in the 60s, there was a big change in teachers, un, teacher unionism where the uh, teachers began to see themselves as part of a broader union movement. The AFT, the American Federation of Teachers, came around. Mm-hmm. who were affiliated with the AFL-CIO. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, nowadays... Um, both the AFT and the NEA see themselves as unions. They do traditional collective bargaining. They also advocate on a lot of other issues. They see themselves as a voice for students, an organized voice for students. Interesting. So the teachers' unions came out of the original unionizing efforts during the Golden Age, mm-hmm. the Gilded Age, and with the robber barons. Right. And then they evolved over time. Right. And so they try. They saw you as someone interested in politics who was a teacher, and they tried to involve you in what they were doing, you said. What did that look like? Uh, well, it was I, you know, relatively simple. The, the um, union puts on, and the school system puts on, a, a big event at the beginning of every school year for new teachers in the school system. It's called mm-hmm. New Educator Orientation. Mm-hmm. And there happened to be a presentation that was being done by the president of the local teachers' union. It's a woman named Bonnie Cullison, who mm-hmm. I now serve with in Annapolis. She's a delegate as well. Um, And we were chatting after the meeting, and she um, found out, I mentioned, that I had some background in political organizing. Mm -hmm. And she recruited me because one of the interesting things about uh, public school teaching as a profession is it is uniquely affected by political decision making, right? Because it's it's an agency of the government. Mm -hmm. Uh, But teachers who have a tremendous amount of work Mm -hmm. uh, tend to be overwhelmed, tend not to have the time to engage politically. So... You know, it was important to Bonnie and to recruit people like me who had some experience and background and could help to magnify the voice of classroom teachers. And so what did it look like for you? Was it ask for you to go to your other colleagues and ask them to contribute dues to the MCEA? Or was it please write letters to your delegates to ask them to fund the schools in this way or the Board of Education? What exactly concretely were you asked to do on top of your teaching responsibilities? Yeah, it was, I mean, it was all of the above. So I served as, in, at the most basic level, I served as what's called a building rep. Mm-hmm. So it was my job to uh, sit on the leadership team at the schools I taught at and to be the voice of teachers. If a teacher had a problem, um, I could help out with it. I mm-hmm. would sometimes sit down and negotiate with the principal about, you know, minor working conditions, things like that. I would try to recruit members to pay full dues mm-hmm. um, and um, and also organize them to help out with the broader union activities. I was also a representative to uh, what's called the Representative Assembly. Teachers unions are democratic organizations. Actually, all unions in the United States are. So um, if teachers are Republican in terms of their political identity. Oh, I, yeah. I don't mean Democratic as in the Democratic Party. I mean small d Democratic uh-huh. in, in terms of the, the, the members have the final say over the decisions that the unions make. But on that topic, mm-hmm. do you have a diversity of political views among Montgomery County public school teachers? Absolutely. I mean, I think the teacher workforce in Montgomery County reflects the politics generally of the county. Mm-hmm. So it hews towards um, the Democratic Party. It hews more liberal. Mm-hmm. Um, but we certainly have a lot of conservative members. And, and um, you know, the, uh, the unions, um, while, you know, they're sort of traditionally seen as aligned with the Democratic Party, um, you know, the unions uh, endorse Republican candidates at times if they're strong supporters of public education. So former Delegate Gene Cryer was endorsed by MCEA. Uh, Councilman Howie Dennis was endorsed by MCEA. Who were Republicans. Right, exactly. And so what if a teacher doesn't want to join? They still have to join? No. So there's something in Maryland called agency fee. Mm-hmm. And, and essentially, here's the way it works. 
regardless of whether you're a member of the union, Mm -hmm. you're protected by the collective bargaining agreement. Mm -hmm. And that's most of the work the union does, is negotiating and defending that agreement. So the people who are not members of the union pay a prorated version of membership dues that only covers the cost of that agreement. Okay. Right? Otherwise, which they benefit from, right? Otherwise, they'd be free riders. They'd be getting all the benefits of the agreement, but without paying anything. And so that's like a fraction, like a, like right. half. It's uh, I think it's like seventy five, eighty percent. Okay. Um, because the, the you know, despite the popular conception, most of the work the unions do has nothing to do with politics, right? It's it's basic building level stuff. It's this principal is treating this teacher badly, and we need to step in and help. Mm-hmm. You know, that sort of thing. Advocates right. in a way. Exactly. exactly. So. Have you, so how, so, so you're a delegate, right? Yes. You're one of 141 delegates in the Maryland House of Delegates. Right. And you represent District 14. Right. You also, in your past, have represented educators. Mm-hmm. You're serving with a former president of the MCEA. Right. Rep, the teachers union that we've been speaking about. Right. Who, what are, what are your priorities? You have so many different constituencies, as every politician does. Right. How do you balance that? How do you know what to prioritize? And then even if you find something to prioritize, how do you, how do you find that, how do you become effective, right? Because it's not just what Eric Lukey wants. Right. It's what 140 others want in addition to whatever's going on in the Senate and the governor's mansion. Mm-hmm. So how do you balance your different constituencies, identify your priorities, and then become effective? It, it, it takes a lot of work and a lot of listening. Um, you know, when I was first running for office and still today, I, I you know, I knock on a lot of doors. Um, I try to talk to individual constituents. And the first question I ask after I introduce myself is, what's on your mind? You know, what's happening that you're concerned about? Um, and that's where I get a lot of my information from about what issues my constituents would like me to focus on. Um, in, you know, Annapolis, uh, because there's 141 of us in the House, um, and because we have a limited amount of time, we only have a 90 day session, you can't work on every issue and you don't need to because mm-hmm. you have colleagues who will often work on those issues. So uh, when you first enter the house, one of the, the good pieces of advice you'll get from people is um, find a niche, find an issue area that's important to you and your constituents that nobody else is working on. Uh, for me, relatively early on, the, one of those niches became special ed. Um, I was interested in, and a lot of my constituents were interested in, in working on issues related to animals. So I work on a lot of uh, humane legislation. Um, I do a lot of work now on small business tax policy because we have a lot of small businesses in my district. Now, were these issues that were naturally interesting to you or are these issues that are driven more by what you're hearing from constituents? Um, some of them were naturally interesting to me. Um, a, a lot of the, I mean... The reality is, if you take a list, a look through the list of bills that we do every session, everybody will find some bills that they look at and say, oh, that's the most boring topic I've ever heard of, mm-hmm. right? Um, and I don't, frankly, I don't find tax policy that fascinating. I know it's important. Mm-hmm. Um, so I do work on it uh, mm-hmm. because it's important. Mm-hmm. But it's not something that, like, I... I Dream about. I, yeah, exactly. Exactly. And so you're introducing some legislation that you personally have an interest in right. just intellectually, right. but then you're also introducing legislation or co-sponsoring legislation or not affiliating your name with legislation, but somehow working behind the scenes to help advance it. Does yeah, that ever take yeah. place? Yeah, that absolutely. That's a really good description. And, you know, so I'll give you an example of the, the latter case. Um, I was appointed four years ago to chair the subcommittee in the House of Delegates that deals with gambling policy, right? Casinos, horse racing, and the lottery. Those are, I I don't gamble. I had never been to a horse track before I started serving on the subcommittee. Um, So it's not a topic that I naturally find interesting. Mm -hmm. And it's frankly... Why were you selected? Well, so because when I was elected, I was put on that subcommittee as one of my three subcommittees. They just needed another body. And I figured if I'm going to be writing laws about this topic, I should learn about it. So Mm -hmm. I took the time to learn about it. And then I became a part of the negotiations in 2013 about the uh, expansion to the gaming in the state of Maryland that happened. And, um, and because the speaker sees me as a neutral party, uh, I, there are no casinos or horse tracks in Montgomery County. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm able to be neutral. Mm-hmm. Right. And that was important to him. Yeah. 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 Because it's a controversial issue, you know, as it should be. I mean, there's a lot of um, difficult policy to deal with there. And so we were talking about how, you might allow other individuals get credit for work that you've done. Why is that? Why would a politician want to do work and not take credit for it? Because we're a team, right? 
Um, and, you know, fundamentally what a legislative body is about is working together to achieve what's best for the constituents of the state. And we all come from our own constituencies and we have to represent them. Mm -hmm. But there's a larger picture. There's a big picture. Um, so, yeah, if there's a good bill that a colleague of mine has introduced, I will happily work very hard on it to try to get it passed. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't need any credit because it's not about credit. It's about doing what the people of Maryland need. Now, in 2018, there's going to be an election. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to know if you're going to run again. But for the purposes of this podcast, let's say you're going to run for re-election for delegate, for okay. the same seat you have. Let's right. just presume that's the case. Right. In that case, you would want to get votes from constituents right. to re-elect you into office. Now, what correlation is there between constituents voting for you to put you back in office and you getting credit for work that you've done in the legislature? Not a tremendous amount. I, I mean, you have to bear in mind a couple of things. One, um, our name ID is terrible. Uh, on average, about 10 to 15 percent of our constituents have ever heard our name before. So you have 120,000 constituents right. and you're saying about 10,000, 15,000 people may actually know you are alive. Exactly. Um, <laughs> How many what proportion of the 120,000 know that there is a state legislature? I think it's probably larger than that. I, I, I think the number of people who actually know what kind of work we do is smaller or what a delegate is. Yeah, I mean, it's... Do they know the title? They they may know the title. Do they um, ever confuse you with the county council? Yes, all the time. And with uh, people in Congress, too, which is not necessarily a good association <laughs> for us. Um, but, yeah, I mean, and, and people also... There's a larger problem in that the, the, the media has taken such a hit recently, both in terms of, uh, from a business angle, right? There's fewer media outlets because there's fewer people reading newspapers, mm -hmm. right? Um, and because I think people trust the media less. So... A lot of people have, I think, less information about local and state government than they used to. Mm -hmm. So they may not know what I've done in Annapolis. What, what matters, I think, most to most of my constituents mm -hmm. is that I show up and that I listen to them and that, you know, that I, around election time, they know what I stand for. Mm -hmm. But now you can't actually physically visit 120,000 constituents or have conversations with yeah. them or be responsive to them. And there aren't 120,000 people sending you emails and making phone calls right, to you. Right. So to the majority of your constituency, you're never going to have direct interaction with them. So you won't have an opportunity to prove that you are responsive. Right. So, so how you do, do you represent that? You do the best you can, right? Uh -huh. um, I am a heavy user of new me of social media. Of um, I have an email list serve I mm -hmm. use heavily. Um, I go to a lot of community meetings in a lot of different parts of my district. Mm -hmm. uh, I try to respond as rapidly as possible anytime someone gets in touch with me. So right. I've gained a reputation of, among my constituency as somebody who's a particularly responsive politician, which mm -hmm. I think is important. Um, and no, I'm not going to greet 122,000 people at the door. But when I first ran for office, I knocked on close to 10,000 doors, um, which is a fair number and fairly representative of my district. Um, so, yeah. so we spoke earlier. Um, actually, you know what? We're sitting now in District 14. Right. Why? What is particular, what is special about this constituency? What defines this community? What is unique about District 14 and why do you live here? It's a, so it's a fascinating district. I originally moved here um, because I was a school teacher and I wasn't making a ton of money. And there aren't a lot of places where a school teacher can afford to buy a house in Montgomery County anymore. Mm -hmm. um, so I moved to Burtonsville because it was affordable and I liked the community. It's a diverse community. You know, people are really great. There's sort of still a little bit of that small town feel. Mm -hmm. you know? um, and that's a, a, sort of the unifying factor in the district. District 14 is a string of smaller communities. Uh, Burtonsville, Spencerville, Olney, Brookville, Laytonsville, Damascus. These and are not big places. For our listeners who may not be familiar with Maryland's geography, District 14 is basically the eastern stretch of Montgomery County. Right. Okay. So, and the southern part of the district where I live is a little bit more urbanized, um, and it's very diverse. Uh, we have a, uh, it's a majority African-American section of the district. Mm -hmm. um, we have a, a huge and growing immigrant population that's pretty, pretty diverse. Um, Latino immigrants, a lot of continental African immigrants, some East Asian immigrants, some South Asian immigrants. Only is a much wealthier community, um, mm -hmm. tends to be a little bit whiter as a community. Um, and Damascus is uh, a, a rural area. So the northern half of my district is 
entirely rural. Now, since our listeners can't see you, what is your demographic? Do you fit in with what you just described? I, I, I'm a white guy. You know, I am, I'm, uh, I, I am not representative necessarily of the diversity of the community, but I do my best to represent it. Right. Um, and, you know, I think in the ongoing conversations we're having about race in the country, it's important for politicians to be able to talk about their the, the impact or, or about their own background mm-hmm. and how it affects them. Um, I am not um, black or Latino. I will never know what it's like to be black or Latino, but I can listen to my black and Latino constituents. Mm-hmm. Right? And, and they, they feel like you represent them. I hope so. I do my best to. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I, particularly given the recent election and given the, the tension that exists in the country right now, I think that's more important than ever. That mm-hmm. politicians, particularly white politicians, because, you know, most politicians in this country still are white. And, and what are most people? Um, well, so in Montgomery County, we're majority minority, right? I mean, you've got a, uh, to take as an example, the House delegation in Montgomery County. The Maryland House of Delegates has... 24 members from Montgomery County, and that is referred to as the delegation. Exactly. And it's majority white um, and still majority male. Mm -hmm. And um, it's become more diverse, Mm -hmm. Um, although there are actually fewer women representing Montgomery County in the legislature than there were 10 years ago. Hmm. Um, Why is that? um, It's a good question. I mean, there's a larger question to be asked there about uh, why we don't have more women in public office. Um, What is diversity? What is diversity? Right. So the reason I ask is right now you're speaking about things that people were born into, identities, right? Right. Male, female, you're born that way. Right. White, Latino, African American, that's the way your physical body looks. Right. But there are also are other elements of diversity, right? It could be religious identity, it could be geographic origin, it could be socioeconomic status, yeah, educational absolutely. achievement, mm-hmm. uh, you know, whether you're, you know, a parent, um, you know, so there's lots of different, so so are all of those um, element, d- diverse identities also represented? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I mean, I think you look at the difference, I, I mean, if you want to talk about, you know, how people make their living, like I said, Damascus in my district is is... Uh, very rural, mm-hmm. right? and there's still a fair amount of farms up there. Mm-hmm. Um, Burdensville is as opposite as you can get from that. Right? Hmm. Um, it's not a rural area at so all. So, how do you represent both? Because you would think that they have almost competing interests at, at, at some point. One wants development, one doesn't want development, maybe. Yeah, I mean, I don't think competing interests. I think there are some unifying factors. Okay. Right? Um, although there are some differences, right? Nobody in Burtonsville cared six years ago when we were debating whether to reduce the estate tax for farmers, mm-hmm. right? Um, but my constituents in Damascus cared, so I worked on the issue, right? Um, but I think the 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 more unifying factors uh, in the district are, are things you'll pull out of each community. Everybody cares about good schools for their kids. Mm-hmm. Everybody wants to be able to get to work in a reasonable amount of time, so they care about transportation. Mm-hmm. Um, everybody wants to be able to make decent pay from a decent day's work, so they care about labor policy. Mm-hmm. Um, and so those are the issues where I spend a lot of my time, and then I also work on the sort of niche issues that matter more particularly to each community. So we're nearing the end of the podcast, and I'd like you to reflect upon your years of public service, starting being an advocate on environmental issues, moving to working on a county council campaign, becoming a school rep with the MCEA for the teachers union, to becoming an elected official, really a politician in your own right for uh, a term or a few terms. Um, Why are you doing this? Has it been easy? Could it have been easier if you hadn't done this? Is it well remunerated? What's your motivation here? Yeah, no, it's not well remunerated. It's not easy. Um, it can be very frustrating, and particularly as a politician, people get mad at you mm-hmm. um, sometimes for nothing you've done, right? Um, but I think, and this goes to sort of fundamental philosophy. Um, I, I'm a, a Unitarian Universalist, and I. Um, have pretty deep moral beliefs. I believe that it it is morally incumbent on all of us to help our neighbor. Um, I think you see that idea mentioned in every major world religion. I think it's something we should be able to universally agree on. So I've made the decision to make my life about helping people as much as I can. 
Um, and it sounds Pollyanna-ish and it sounds naive and it sounds idealistic, but that's honestly where I'm coming from. And when I'm able to help people, um, that is a great feeling. So that has been Delegate Eric Lutke, who speaks about having a moral imperative to help uh, others and really finding that, that it's rewarding and uh, that he is well, that he's capable of doing it. And because uh, he has that capability, he feels responsible to serve his community. And uh, that is, it's a responsibility that he thinks we all share um, to care for each other because we are in this together and nobody gets out alive. So this has been episode 50 of Public Interest Podcast with your host, Jordan Cooper, where we interview politicians, activists, advocates, and others who seek to improve the state of the world. Thank you so much for joining us, and we'll talk to you next time.